today, we get a chance to welcome one of the classic artists that really framed hip-hop and made it an international venture. Uh, the first artist signed to a major label, uh, first artist, hip-hop artist to perform overseas. He impacted everybody in his generation and everybody since exists in hip-hop and has a career because of him. Uh, so really, we're getting just a prime chance. So before we start the film, uh, 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 he's going to come up, say a few words, so if we can give him another round of applause, please. Yes. Yes. Hello everyone, how are you doing today? Great. Yeah. Good, good. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for the great introduction. As he said, my name is Curtis Walker, a.k.a. Curtis Blow. You may know me from um, my most recent old school song, which was uh, featured on the NBA 2K12, uh, the song Basketball. They're playing basketball. So I did songs like that and the breaks and Christmas rapping. Uh, Nas did one of my songs, If I Rule the World Over. Um, a lot, a lot of hits back in the 80s. But I'm here to talk to you today about the history of this $6 billion a year industry called rap. Now, uh, I want to first give you a little uh, introduction on the film and what you're about to see. Um, and talk to you a little bit about it because it's very, very important to me. Uh, we did this 10 years, well, 15 years ago in 1999. And when we were going to edit, we went to New York uh, to edit. And that was like early 2000. And so we were in New York hanging out, setting up the studio and everything. So a few months went by and then came September the 11th. We were supposed to start editing on September 13th. And so those planes hit the World Trade Center. And the director, he was staying downtown in Midtown Manhattan. And he saw the planes hit. He was so scared. He thought it was a war and everything. He, he ran out of his hotel room, went all the way across town Manhattan, and ran across the bridge into Queens. And he never stepped back, foot back into Manhattan. So we've been trying to edit this film. So I had to go out to Europe. They didn't want to work in New York. We were, we were set back because New York was going crazy around that time, September 11th. Then we went to war. Things got messed up even further, trying to get a deal And after we finished editing. So here we are now, 15 years later, the film has not come out since. But it's so very important because the film was set at, uh, in the Bronx, where we had a big round table discussion with all of these old school DJs. Because it's my contention that um, when you talk about the history of rap, um, it's the individual contributions pieced together uh, like a puzzle. So you have all of these guys, these pioneering DJs, who made contributions, and uh, they all have their own stories, but their individual stories pieced together tell the whole uh, gamut of, of, of the genesis, the beginning of hip-hop. Now, um, hip-hop, what is hip-hop? And we need to differentiate between hip-hop and rap. Um, hip-hop is a culture. It's a way of life for a society of people, young people, who love and cherish the elements of hip-hop, which are rapping, or emceeing, uh, DJing, or scratching, uh, uh, aerosol art, or graffiti, and then there's the b-boy, or breakdancing. And these four elements, these original elements, together, combined together, make up what is known as hip-hop. Now, KR, I, lo I love to quote KRS-One when he says, you know, rap is something that you do, but hip-hop is something that you live. So it's a way of life. It's a way of life. And, and what is culture? Culture is just that, a way of life. I mean, I'm getting ready to go to Japan next week, and I'm just thinking about, you know, the Japanese culture. I mean, they have so many things, intricate, 
intricate things that they do within their culture that makes them unique in the world as opposed to us Americans, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so each country, each race, each group of people, they have their culture, it's their way of life, what they do throughout the course of the day, the music that they listen to, the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they hold the microphone, you know, these are the things, the aesthetics, you know, aesthetics is beauty. What, what is beauty in our eyes, in our culture? So we have kids writing on the walls, but it's beautiful to us. This, 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 this um, spray paint that they use on these old dilapidated trains, you know, making these murals, big murals that are colorful and for the eyes to see miles and miles away. And you'll see this. But this is our art, our aesthetics, the things that we, we do throughout the course of the day. The clothes we wear, it's part of our culture. So that's what hip-hop is. Hip-hop is basically culture, a way of life. So when you talk about the history of hip-hop, um, I wanted to key in on rap, because rap is the most important part. It's like the most successful, you know. Hip-hop is like a mother of four babies. So one of the children, the rapper, he makes it successful in business. So is he supposed to forget about his brothers and his family? Or is he supposed to support them and help them along to become successful too? So this is what we're doing in hip-hop. Telling the story of hip-hop through rap, the most important, the most influential, the most successful part of hip hop. Now, when we talk about the movie, there are different themes in the movie. There's our contention that, um, well, it first started with the DJ. Back in the days, you know, in the early days, we tell this story seven, eight years before the first record came out in 1979, which was King Tim III. Uh, personality jock, and then of course the Sugar Hill Gang with Rappers Delight, everyone knows that song. And so seven, eight years before that, we were rapping and scratching and break dancing, doing our thing in the Bronx and Harlem and, and all the boroughs in New York, seven, eight years before the first record came out. So all of these guys who are rocking and doing their thing, making their contributions, this is the story we tell. The guys who really, really pioneered the whole culture way before the first records. And when the first records came out, I call that the jump to light speed. And a lot of cats didn't make the jump to light speed. You know, you had a couple of groups that did, like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, of course, Run DMC, uh, and myself, right? So we tell that story going all the way up to those first records that came out. And here's another theme. Okay, it started with the DJ. The DJ was the boss. He was the focal point of the party. You all know disco, Donna Summer, uh, uh, YMCA, uh, you know, Village People, all those songs, the monotonous thump, 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 disco beat that happened during that time. And then here comes these DJs, these street DJs, who actually were representing, but they really didn't like the disco music that was happening because we grew up on James Brown. We grew up on the Motown sound. You know, my parents, you know, my mom, she loved Sam Cooke and, 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 and Jackie Wilson and people like that. And, and of course, I became a James Brown fan. So that type of music that came out of the 60s got lost when the 70s came out, when disco came out. So we, as uh, the young B-boys, I would say, or, or the young uh, hip-hop culture just coming up, we wanted to party with the music that we remember, and we didn't like this uh, disco music because it was sort of like, you know, we didn't have the money to pay to get into these clubs. That's what disco was about. You know, you, you, you worked all week, and then you put on, on the weekend, you put on a suit and tie and silk dresses, and you go downtown to the club, pay five, ten dollars to get in, See the big disco ball with the lights flashing on all the mirrors on everybody's fly looking pretty and you dance your night away, right? <laughs> so right. That, that that thing for us, we were too young. We didn't have the money to pay to get into these clubs. 
and we were too young. So Flash, because it was more of like there, there, there was uh, different markets. There, there was an age group. There, there were the haves and have-nots. There were the disco people, and then you had the underground, the young kids coming up, who wanted to party. They couldn't get into the club, didn't have the money to pay to get in. So we partied uptown in the gyms, in the, the parks. That's when block parties started, because the kids couldn't get in. So we still wanted to. So this was our way of you know, getting a part, being a part of that disco. But at the same time, the music was so very, very important. Because we didn't play the same kind of music in the disco and the music that you heard on the radio. So you had these two different markets. Grandmaster Flash calls them uh, the shoe people and then the sneaker people. <laughs> and, you know, so the, the shoe people being the adults who had the money to get in, and then the sneaker people being the young kids just trying to fit in and trying to do the same thing. So. That's where you have it. Then you have these two factions. They had their own DJs. You had street DJs who would only play in the parks. You had street DJs who would only play in block parties and, 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 and the gyms and, and the community centers and the house parties and stuff like that. But then you had the DJs who really were rocking New York well. Yeah, this week we're going out to Club Nell Gwynn's to see New York's number one DJ, Pete DJ Jones Jones. You know, that was on the radio. <laughs> what Pete was, he was a hot DJ, you know. But then you had other DJs who weren't like that hot, and they played different kind of music, b-boy music, that James Brown music. So it was different crowds, a different crowd. I say the disco rappers and the disco DJs, and then you had what is known as the b-boys, or real hardcore underground hip-hop. So you have two factions coming out. And these, these two factions were competitive. I call them the haves and have-nots. They were really competitive. They didn't like each other. They competed. And their markets were different. Their crowds didn't like each other. You know, I'm a b-boy wearing my you know, hat backwards, going up to a cool hurt party, b-boying. But I couldn't do that at a club downtown. If I'm b-boying in the club, they're looking at me, I got, you know, where's your suit? You know, you can't go down on the floor with your suit on. You know, so they looked at you crazy if you really tried to break dance and stuff at the club. So that was more like, so the markets were different, and it was really, really strange. Okay, so that's basically it. Those um, um, different themes throughout the movie, you'll see that repeated, but it's very, very important that you know that up front. And the other thing, like I was saying, the DJ was the boss in the beginning. He, the DJ was the focal point of the party. He controlled the music. He controlled the lights in the club. He controlled the ambiance, the tempo of the music. You know, he played fast jams, and then he'd break it down and throw on the love jams, and then we dance slow, you know, the L and all that, right? <laughs> he controlled all of that. He hired and fired the MCs. The MCs were a dime a dozen in the beginning. All the MCs did was, we used to carry the equipment for the DJ mm -hmm. and set it up in the club. And at the end of the night, we'd break it down and take it back to the house. And the DJ was nice enough, he'd let us make announcements. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd get into the party for free and talk to the girls. <laughs> so, so, so that was our thing. But we were making announcements. Yo, Joey, your mom's outside. It's 10 o'clock. You got to go home. Yo, Sam, your car's getting towed. <laughs> That's the original MC. <laughs> That's all we did. But then came the changing of the guard when that record, first rap records, the MC got the opportunity to stand out front and do more than tell jokes. He started rapping and entertaining the crowd. And using crowd response was a big, big, big thing back then. Like, you're in the New York's number one club, now Gwen is listening to the sounds of Pete DJ Jones. And if you feel good, if you really feel good, throw your hands in the air and say, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> if you really feel good, everybody screams. Oh. <laughs> That's where it came from. The MC exciting the crowd, already taking the crowd on where they were, and just, you know, motivating them to have a good time. That's how it first started out. So this whole thing 
with the changing of the guard, we got the opportunity to hire and fire the DJs. That's why you know the first DJs, you know, when they when they started, you had people like Grandmaster Flash in the Furious Five MC. You know, uh, you had uh, 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 Eric B and Rock Kim. Mm -hmm. You know, the DJ was first. He was the boss. But then the changing of the guard happened. Then you had people like, oh, run DMC and Jam Master J. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? We started paying the DJ. The DJ wasn't paying us because we got the record deals. Mm -hmm. We were doing the vocals. So we got the record deal. Sometimes the DJ got to be a part of that contract, sometimes not. Sometimes, uh, and, and now, guys, 30, 40 years later are fighting about this. Like Houdini, for instance, mm. they're fighting over the name Houdini. The DJ, Grandmaster D, stole the name. And he took the name and put a patent on the name. And say, Houdini can't use Houdini, because I never got my royalties. Mm. So now he took the name. Sugar Hill Gang's fighting, same way, mm -hmm. same way. This is another group, UTFO. Mm. Kango and, and, and Doc Ives, mm -hmm. one of the members stole the name and they can't use it unless they come to him. And so it's, it's, it's crazy. It's now really, really starting to be a problem with this. But that whole thing, the changing of the guard, started way back when the first records came out. Last thing, okay, hip hop almost was destroyed and you'll see this in the film. It was almost destroyed by gang violence. And in the 70s, I know you saw the, have you ever seen the movie Warriors? Mm -hmm. Remember that one? Warriors, come on, play! Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, sir. That thing was just like the Bronx in the mid-70s. Where, I mean, I remember running home from school every day. Oh, the black spades are coming! You know, and it was really, really a tough time for you to be a young kid going to school, teenager, and living in a gang environment. But what saved us was, was hip hop. You know, and Africa Bambada tells a story of how he was a gang member and he got together with all the gangs and said, let's stop killing each other, let's stop the violence, let's go and just start doing this new thing called hip hop and forget about all this crazy mess and let's just have some love, peace, unity, and a good old time, you know, without hip hop. And so, you know, that's really what saved hip hop. Other than that, it was the rap record. Because even though a lot of those hip hop parties, the, 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 the security at the parties, they would rob you. Mm. I'm going out, you know, to a club, to a, to a hip hop party, and I get my, my brand new coat taken, so I gotta go back home, and my mom beats me twice. <laughs> Once for coming home so late, and twice for wearing your coat. You know, so it was rough. You know, we stopped going out because the gangs would rob you at the parties. In the middle of the party, they start shooting, and everybody's running. But while you're running in all the chaos, they're snatching chains, they're beating you up, taking your coat, taking your brand new shoes, and all of that. So it was really a problem. And so people stopped going out to hip hop parties like at night. 1978. You tell the story. And uh, so Bambada was a big part of that and, and smoothing that over. And the rap record, really, when that came out, it really, that's when it exploded because it was really dead right before the rap record came out. So that's the story. And um, I'll wait for your questions after. We'll, let's take a look at the film, The History of Rap. Thank you. <laughs> Quickly, before we get started, just one last thing I want to say. We are here because of one person. This person approached me after class one day, after the hip-hop class, and she said, hey, you think you want to have Curtis Blow here? And I looked at her like, yeah, whatever. You know, yeah. <laughs> she walked away for a second, and she came back and handed me the phone. And I, you know how the iPhone is. I look at it, it says Curtis Blow, and I'm like, yeah, right, what? Help. Yes, sir. <laughs> so I want us to, if we could thank Miss Kia Jones for a moment. Turn up, oh. Hip hop and what has become rap now. Yes. Can you give me a name or five 
preferably five. About the top five people you think stick to this culture of hip hop and have stayed true to what hip hop really is. And have not converted to rap and what the media say is hip hop and rap. Okay, uh, well, let me, let me address that first part because that's kind of like important because it, it takes me back to, to the Grand Wizard Theodore. You know him, the guy who created Scratching, uh, Flash's protege. And, and Theodore said, you know, when we first started in, in the early 70s and the 80s, we were MCs, master of ceremonies, meaning we could rock a house <coughs> anywhere. It didn't matter where we were, on a street corner, in a club, in a gym, a big concert, you know, didn't matter. You're a master of serving. You mastered wherever you were, you were that MC to make it happen. Nowadays, and, 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 and Theodore, he said that the MC, our job was to, to entertain and build up our community. But the difference now between that and the rapper, the so called rapper, that started when the record started coming out. We changed, and now they, they consider us as rappers because of the records that we make. But it seems like what Theodore, he said, he said, uh, the MC build, they, we build our, we, you know, we motivate our community to grow, and we build up our communities, but the rapper, he tears it down. And that's the big difference between an MC and a rapper. But... Uh, uh, second part of your question, the top five MCs today, of course, you know I like uh, the conscious rap, you know, people like Talib, Kweli, Common, Nas, he's a good one. Uh, for what it's worth, I like Eminem. He has an incredible flow, he's very fast and witty and sick with it, and it's a challenge for old school to keep up with that, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to, you know, evolve to where I can be as fast as that. I like his, if he ever gets his head straight and makes some good lyrics, he has the potential of really being a great leader. Am I right? Uh, 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 here's another one. Uh, Buster Rhymes. I'm hey. in the yes. Most in crowd. I'm, I'm in the speed, you know, tongue twister, that type thing. Did you hear that record between Buster Rhymes and tongue twister? Mm. It was on a, on, a, on a video game, I think it was, on Fight Night. It was on that video game. And they were just going back and forth like, wow, speed is what I need. That's I like that. I like that. So those are my top five rappers. Next question. Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to know, because I know the history of like, where the B-Boy started. Right. And I want to know from your point of view, in your eyes growing up in the Bronx, right. like who were the first female B-Girls? Mm, oh, Nobody my talks gosh. About Nobody it's talks not. about, but I know them. <laughs> the B girls, the ones that actually yes. put and everything. Yeah, and you know what? This is so very important, that question, because the evolution of dance and hip hop, the B boys, how where it came from, you know, because we came out of that world of disco, right? Mm -hmm. And and when we were in the disco, people were dancing the hustle. That was the number one dance. Right? You remember the hustle? You ever seen that? People dance together and they do that. I remember that dance. Everyone was doing the hustle. But you see, then came this DJ, Cool Herc. Now he was, like PTJ Jones was an excellent DJ. He played the music, like when he was talking about, you know, with the 12 inch and keeping that beat part, the jump part going. That was because we could do the hustle. Now, if you had a DJ who didn't have precision timing to keep the groove together, you would mess up your hustle. Now, this is an inside story. I hope you guys don't tell anyone this. But <laughs> cool Herc was not, he, 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 he was a great DJ because of his playlist, not because of his skills of DJing. Precision timing was Pete DJ Jones. We did the hustle all night long and didn't skip a beat because of his timing, right? Flash had great timing, too. He had speed and time. But Herc, when you went up to the Bronx, Herc wasn't that great as a, as, as a DJ. So he would try and make an attempt to play those disco songs so we could do the hustle. But it wasn't working. And we used to get mad at him because we would, he would miss the beat and we would mess up our, our, our dance. And that you could, he single-handedly destroyed the hustle. 
Mm-hmm. And and so that was very, very, very important. So that's why the B-Boy see, and, and it was so very important. Like to go back to Saturday Night Fever, the movie Saturday Night Fever. You remember seeing that? John Travolta. Mm-hmm. Remember in the club scene we had the white suit on, he's mm-hmm. in the club. Right, he's dancing. It's twelve or one o'clock at night. They play on the hot song. Everybody's dancing, have a great time. And then here comes this one guy. He's dancing better than everybody else. What's the crowd do? They step back, create a circle around him. Right? Somebody comes in there and does battle with him. He's battling, dancing in the club. The winner of that battle is the most popular guy. He gets the girl. Right? <laughs> this same thing happened at a cool hurt party. But these dancers in that circle, the circle is called a cipher. The cipher is still around today. But those guys inside the circle were doing the James Brown moves. Everybody wanted to be James Brown with that fancy footwork. You know, and then you, you know, boom, boom, wham, wham, bam, bam, get down to the ground and go on the ground. It's all, it's a wrap, you know? You're the winner of that battle inside that circle. And you become, so those guys inside the circle were called. B boys, Bronx boys, or break boys. Or boogie because, boys. Or boogie boys. And, and and they were the guys dancing to the, the songs that Cool Herc played. <coughs> and he played those special kind of songs that would have that break. And when that break came, that's when you would do your best moves, create a circle. And that's where it comes from. So um, I used to, I, I was like mm, 13, 14. And we used to have a club in Harlem called Chuck Center. And this DJ, this is way before I met Cool Herc. I met Cool Herc in 1974. But this is like 72, 73, mm-hmm. when I could barely get into a club. But this is an all-ages club. And the guy was playing this kind of music that Cool Herc was playing. So, wow, we're in there. And, and, and I'm from my neighborhood. I'm a young kid, Lil Kurt, great B-boy, right? So my block, the older kids used to come get me because it was shock value. You have a little kid dancing in the club, and he's got good moves. He's winning, you know. It's like a female or a real big fat guy. You know, we call that shock value. They usually win the crowd. So my block used to always come get me, and we used to go to Chuck Center. And back then when it first started, which was amazing, is that we didn't do the hustle anymore. No, guys were... B-boying, but we used to dance against the girls first. And that was the whole thing. We were battling the girls, and the girls were dope. They had this one girl, her name was Kellogg's. She's one of the first one, first ones that she had the reputation. And she was the one, like, if you dance against Kellogg's, she was so good, you got your hat, you know, you're dancing with Kellogg's, and you're doing your moves. <laughs> You go down to the ground, she'll take your hat and throw it across the room. <laughs> you got to run and go get it. Oh. And she won. You know, the crowd, oh, they laugh at you and everything. But she did moves like that. And there was a, another girl, my first girlfriend, her name, oh, she was, she, I, because back then we had a special look. We, we wore sweatsuits, right? Adidas, Puma, you know, that's before Nike, right? We used to wear sweatsuits. But my whole thing, I used to wear white sweatsuit. Because I was a little curt, you know. So I wore a white sweatsuit, white hat, and my white super pro kids. <laughs> I mean, this is before Converse's. We used to wear pro kids and then super pro kids. Super pro kids had a red and blue stripe on the end. And I had a, a, a sweatsuit, a white sweatsuit with a red and blue stripe that came down, right? So I was like, wow. Then I went to, so Kellogg's had a partner, her name was Cynthia, I mean Stephanie, I'm sorry, Steph. Stephanie was a, a, a short girl by my side, and I just fell in, because she had a white sweatsuit on too. And she was great, and we used to dance together, man, wow. I remember one Easter Sunday, you know about Easter, you know you wear your, your vines, your best clothes and stuff, and we finally had, a, a, she came up to my block, and, 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 uh, we became boyfriend and girlfriend. And that was a great time. That was Steph. Wow. But she was a great B girl. And that was the thing. The girls used to dance against the guys back in the day. Before, way before the guys 
broke out and doing a competition. Is this around the Zulu Queen, Zulu King era? No, no, this is way before that. Now, this, that's a whole controversy in that, too, uh, uh, about the start of the Zulu Nation. Mm -hmm. I know Bambada's claim in 1973, but that's a little controversial. P people will, you know, talk about that. I don't want to go any further with that. All right, next question. Yeah, do you think that hip-hop is dead? And if so, how do you think it can be revived? Uh, I remember when Nas said that in 2007, I immediately went out on tour <laughs> in, in Europe, <laughs> and I filmed every place that I went to, and I called this series Hip Hop Alive Around the World, because I just thought that that was so preposterous to even make that statement when, you know, you travel outside of America, you go to Germany, they rap in German. You go to Spain, they rap in Spanish. You go to France, they rap in French and Japan, Japanese. Ching chang tell them I got you yet. They have their own hip hop scene. It's not a, the American hip hop scene. You go to Germany, it's the German hip hop scene. So they have embraced the culture and made it their own culture. And cats are rapping in their native tongues and they're the top pop artists in their country. So it's definitely more alive than ever. Yeah. Um, I was about to say. Oh yeah. When did you um, realize that this is what you wanted to do, uh, being a hip hop scene? Like, what like, what like kind of like got you um, inspired to do it? What kind of made you like realize okay, I want to do this? Very my life? good question. Because uh, actually, it, it, it was uh, career day when I was 13. I keep going back to that age, 1972. Uh, was career day. I figured it all out. Um, I was traumatized that, that year, too, because I got a chance. Uh, well, I always was the family DJ at 6 and 7, and that was my whole thing. I loved the way the, the needle of the record went over and dropped down exactly on the record, and I used to run around at the family gatherings and the holidays and our house parties and birthdays and stuff. I was the family DJ. I used to run around and take the requests from my parents and all my aunts and uncles at seven and eight, you know, and I'd go back to the record player and play them for everybody, right? But when I was 13, career day, I know I wanted to be a scientist. My mom wanted to be a scientist, wanted me to be a scientist. I was actually uh, uh, academically, uh, um, I, I was special. I had a, a 12th grade reading level in fourth grade. So they put me in these special classes, IGC, Intellectually Gifted Children. And all of us in the fourth grade, from fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, we all vowed to become scientists. I wanted to make a mechanical heart. But um, um, my buddies, they went to Bronx High School of Science, and one guy went to the moon. His name is Michael Simon. He's an astronaut. Another guy, uh, one of my partners, Carlton O'Neill, he's a, a, a scientist. But a pharmacist, he deals in pharmaceuticals and he gives lectures and stuff like that. But uh, it was 13 career day uh, in junior high school where I said I wanted to actually break into the music industry, be a DJ, meet the context for the music industry, then record albums. Then later on, I was going to produce movies and write movies and act, act in, in films and and then produce movies, and then in the twilight of my life, I was going to write books and, and, and paint, because I'm, I'm, I'm an artist. I went to music and art high school. So I figured it out then, and it all came to pass. Praise God. It was, like, real cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I have a question. Yes? When is this coming? That's a good question, too. <laughs> you know, uh, you heard all of that music that's playing in the background. I just did the, the stats on it. 35 songs. Each song is averaged at $5,000 per song to get a clearance, a license to actually have it in the film. All right? We have 17 pieces of vintage footage. Each one of those pieces is five thousand, an average of five thousand dollars a piece. So.
Then we have the James Brown footage, which is extra, 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 mm. extraordinarily expensive. Mm. They want $50,000 a minute Ooh. for James Brown footage. That's how expensive he is, right? So I figured it all out. It, it's going to cost about $390,000 to actually get all the vintage footage and the, the music cleared and licensed so we can put the film out. That's the only thing that's holding us up. And that's a problem because the average documentary, the budget that they give you, at the top of the line is $250,000. So we're way behind that. I'm trying to get people... You heard of the Kickstarter program? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about doing a Kickstarter yeah. very seriously to raise the capture so we can complete it because it's so very important. Now, now VH1 just had a, a history of hip hop on a couple of weeks back. You saw it? Something like this, very, very close. And but see, a lot of these guys are not here anymore. Yeah. P. D. J. Jones, rest in peace. He just died like like a month ago, 30 days ago. The first guy. You know, PTJ Jones is not here. Uh, the guy Champagne is not here. Um, and guys are getting one of the Sugar Hill Gang guy. He's getting ready to, to to leave us. I mean, he's so sick. He has cancer and all of this, and it's really tough for him. So these guys are, uh, and 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 the footage. I, I hate to say this, you know, it, it, it gains value when when we die, mm -hmm. and nobody has footage of Pete DJ Jones. So it's so very important that we keep this. I, I'm not really uh, too concerned that it's gonna come out immediately right away or whatever, but I knew I know we, we wanna do a, a, a limited theatrical release. That is the plan, you know, if we do 13 cities, that's great. Uh, uh, that will get us a, a consideration for Academy Award and then going to DVD. I've had all kinds of offers just to put it out on DVD from Europe to, to South America to, you know, everywhere. Uh, we get so many offers to do that, but, you know, it's going to cost us to do the clearances. And hopefully, prayerfully, very soon. I'm talking to some people. If we do the Kickstarter and get it done, it will be out before 2015. So, pray for us. Yes. Um, first of all, I just have to say that it's wonderful, and thank you for coming out. Um, thank you. You have definitely an inspiration. Um, I think uh, the question that I have is for you is, is that what can we do to resurrect um, the true lyricism um, that's that's not existing in today's in today's market, in today's music market, and and a lot of people. I'm glad that you're breaking down the difference between rap and hip hop music. But what's happening is it used to be a point in time where the MC was gauged by his skill, his lyrical content, mm. his metaphorical content, and the freestyle. Right. And the art of freestyle, is, it seems all it seems like that's dying amongst like the true MCs are dying out because right. there's more rappers than real MCs. And a lot of people like we interview and I interview a lot of MCs and they don't even know what the four elements are. Wow. So what can we do in your in your mind? Um, in your opinion, to resurrect the true lyricism and, and bring back the real MC? Well, a couple of things. You know, each one teach one is so very important. You know, one-on-one -on -one conversations. But, you know, we, we live in an age now where there, there's, there's a generation gap. Yeah. I'm 54 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a son, 28, who's been rapping since he was nine. And we, we, we go at it. Because he's DMX, he's Lil Wayne, he's Drake, he's all of them guys. And, and his lyrics are lyrics of today. But the only way that you can bridge this gap is through love. I think, you know, not being frustrated and, 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 and angry. Because I, 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 I travel around the country and the world, and people my age, they're mad. They don't like this hip hop that's going on today. They cursing up the storm. They disrespecting the ladies. It's all about materialism, bling bling stuff. They say, you know. And so my crew, my people, are angry. But that's not the way that you're gonna get the young people to listen to you. You gotta show love. You gotta give them their props because it's their time now, and they need to understand that it's their choices 
to make. Not our choices for them. Uh, I could say lead by example, right? I made over 200 rap songs and never cursed. Mm. But I can't force that on anybody. I can't say, yo, you got to be like me. I don't want that to happen. I could say is that I love you, and I think that you're great. Hip-hop of today is incredible. The raps are faster. They're wittier. They're more complicated. We got mad flavor, mad variety. We got the West Coast. We got uh, uh, Nelly over St. Louis and Common and, 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 and uh, uh, um, uh, Kanye in Chicago, traditional New York. We got the Dirty South. You know, it's crazy right now. There's a lot of flavor out there. And my hat goes off to the real lyricists. But where are the guys that are opposed to keeping it real, like everybody says, telling it how it is, you know, instead of telling it how it is, how about we tell it how it should be? <laughs> you know, where are those cats? But you got to get to them. They have to have an ear to hear. You know what I'm saying? I remember talking to Buster Rhymes one day, and Buster was like, in the middle of his show, he just went off. There was a heckler, and he just went off in the rhyme. He's rapping, cursing them out, and doing this. And everybody say, fuck you. Yeah. Everybody say, fuck you, too. I was like, whoa. <laughs> so after the show, I went up to him. I said, yo, Buster, that was a great show. My man, you did your thing. But what was going on with you and that heckler? You really blasted him. Like, oh, wow. Right? He said, no, nah, Kirk, you know, it's like, yo, I had to go here because, you know, he just kept going at me, so I lost him. I said, well, you know, that's okay, you know. That's okay. You did good. You blasted him, and he understands. You know, he understands. Don't mess with Buster Brown. <laughs> right? <laughs> but I supported him and what he did, so later on that night, he was like, Yo, Kirk, man, yo, I want to talk to you, man. You know, like, I mean, I need to know, you know, uh, what, 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 what should we be doing? You know, these, you know, I, I, I see a lot of young rappers doing So he came to me and started asking me, you know, what should he do? He asked me for advice. That's my opportunity and my time to teach. Mm -hmm. You got to wait for that perfect timing and not go on a rah, rah, rah like he is. Because anger is not going to do anything but breed anger. Right, so tell the truth in love, and it's about love. That's how we bridge that down. Right. Yes. In the back. Question. Thanks for being here today. Is it too early to have a rapper's hall of fame? A rapper's hall of fame. Uh, they're creating one. Yeah. Up in the Bronx, we just we just got a um 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 of uh, the congressman, and they they're setting aside. A big, there's a big armory, the Kingsbridge Armory in the Bronx, on the west side of the Bronx. And they're going to turn this into a big multi complex. And in this complex is going to be a hip hop hall of fame, a museum, a hip hop museum hall of fame. So it's coming very soon. All right. All right. Yes. Yeah, I have a quick, first of all, I want to say thank you for coming to Fresno because it's hard to get uh, uh, elders. From, from the hip hop culture to come out here and really uh, drop knowledge on, on, on Fresno because we a lot of uh, uh, the Fresno community doesn't really know that much of the rich history because of where we at. Right. Uh, so thank you for coming out here. No My question is, back when you was coming up in the 70s, how hard was it or how easy was it to just set up, like for example, like uh, set up a, a jam because of what I see from the footage, it was always the B-boys, the MCs and the DJs like right there. And I'm wondering if was it all all four elements combined when you guys threw down? And how easy was it to have, for example, a throw down at the park or in the projects? Um, because I think that's something that that I, for me, I, I'm I'm from I'm from Brooklyn, I'm from New York City as well. Right. Uh, from Bushwick, and we used to just do it in the summertime, just open the pump, and somebody come out with the with the turntables. Right. And they would just like three, four speakers from four different houses, and we'll just right. plug them in and just have a party. But over here, it's like. Is, is that that's not that's not a reality uh, uh, for many no. times for people, no. whatever reasons. <laughs> so I'm wondering is so we because for example, my boy Mikey Eyes, we're both from Zoo. Uh, we we volunteer at time and we do. Uh, we uh, I, I play my music. I DJ at Romaine Park, and they break, and the other people come, and that's like one way of, of, of showing 
the beauty of hip hop culture to the community. I wonder if back in the day, how hard was it, or how easy was it to just get together and, and do jazz? Very yeah. easy. That that was the great thing, and and <coughs> just the energy. Remember, Chuck D said the energy between 1975 and 1980. You couldn't imagine the 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 energy, the spirit, the the vibe that was going throughout those five boroughs. I mean, if you had a cat, every block had a DJ. You, you t uh, New York is all blocks, city blocks. So you go from, like, say, 110th Street all the way up to 200th Street. That's 90 blocks. Every block had a DJ in the mid-'70s. So on Saturdays, they come out, bring their sound, sound system. If they weren't working, they bring their sound system out. And the community knew it, knew it. And they supported it. Like I said, the MC build, we used to build up the community. We were heroes. Nowadays, if you come, with, you come around with your gold chains or whatever, and you're a popular MC, they're going to rob you. Because you got all the money, right? But back then, it was all about the love. It was just, we weren't trying to make you know, the money. We were just trying to entertain and have people to have a good time. So yeah, how, everybody, everybody supported. No, that's the whole mystique of, of, of hip hop too. Mm -hmm. it, it was just the three elements. Just three. Okay. Yeah, it was the rapper, the, D, the DJ, the rapper, and the and the people with b boys, the, the dancers, you know, and the music. So uh, when that movie Wild Style came out, right. Right. that's when they associated uh, graffiti with hip hop, mm. and it came that 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 fourth element. Okay. I mean, even though even though I used to write graffiti myself, you know what I mean? But I didn't associate it with the other three. You know, I was just one of the things that we did, you know, as 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 part of the culture. And I said, our way of life, you know, we're teenagers, so we had our magic markers, and we used to write on the trains, you know. You go on a train ride, you're bored sitting there on the train, so you write your name there. Curtis was here, and now I'm gone. I left my name to carry on. Those who knew me knew me well. Those who didn't can go to hell. <laughs> you know, we used to write stuff like that. So it just, you know, passing the board, pass the time away. Same word. <laughs> so at what point in, in history of, the, of, of hip hop did graffiti become one of the elements of hip hop? Right after the uh, uh, movie Wild Style. That's Charlie okay. Ahern. I think that came out, when did it come out? 80. One? Yeah, I think two. Yeah. Something like that. That was one. That was the first. I was actually watching it the other day on Netflix. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the first hip hop movie. Eighty one. But now they've added more elements. And so now they've, they've added, added like, more elements. Uh, um, you know, popping and locking, popping, street entrepreneurship. You know, popping and locking became beatboxing, uh, fashion, the clothes you wear. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 and promoters, the, yeah. the businessmen, mm -hmm. the element. Yes. One more question. Um, can you speak uh, on the history of the Mercedes ladies? Wow, you heard of the Mercedes ladies. <laughs> Mercedes, I didn't have them in it. You didn't see anything on Mercedes ladies, huh? Wow. The Mercedes ladies, very good friends of mine. Um, um, they were the first female rap group. And 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 Shah Rock, she stakes claim as as being the first female of rap. But the first female rap group was a group called the Mercedes Ladies. There were like five girls, and 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 they pitted themselves. They they mimic Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five MCs. Yeah. Actually, the lead girl Sherry Sherry Sher, um, she lived on 183rd Street in PAL. Now the PAL was a, was a community center where we used to give all of our jams. That was our first jams. Uh, they talked about the battle, Fantastic and the Cold Crush. That happened at the PAL. Uh, I remember playing there with Grandmaster Flash many a times. But the Mercedes ladies lived on top of the PAL, which is a big project building, Webster Project. And they lived up on the 20th floor, right? And so I remember going to their house many a times and just hanging out with them. But they were the first female rap group. They never made the jump to light speed and making records. Like I said, you know, a couple of groups didn't make it, you know. Uh, uh, but they were definitely there. They had a name. 
They used to see we were like local bands before the record came out. Mm -hmm. Promoters used to hire us. We could, you know, put them on the flyer. There are many flyers from back in the days. You know, you you give out, you know, a thousand flyers. People would come to your party. And so we used to do the jams at the community centers like the PAL. We had another place downtown in Midtown Manhattan called the Hotel Diplomat. Uh, we had many spots. We used to, the Disco Fever came on in the 80s, from the 80, 80 to 85. That was that club. But um, yeah, Mercedes ladies, true legends, true pioneers in hip hop, and the real first rap group I ever heard, female rap group. Like the Sequence Girls. You ever heard of Sequence? Mm -hmm. Don't funk you right on up. Don't funk you right on up. Blondie. That was Sugar Hill Records, but they made the first record uh, for a female rap group. Yes? Have you ever thought about teaching a hip hop studies course like Dr. Johnson? Well, actually, I, I did. I've made uh, many um, um, lectures. You know, I've been all over to many colleges. I've been to Tuskegee, Fordham, mm -hmm. Columbia, uh, University of Michigan, Cal State Northridge, UCLA. So I've been lecturing. I, I did prepare a curriculum for a Hip Hop 101 class mm -hmm. that uh, Christopher Martin, uh, AKA Play from Kid and Play, mm -hmm. he teaches now. He started teaching uh, uh, that uh, uh, North Carolina Central, mm -hmm. and then he he went. He's now at Tallahassee at Florida A and M, teaching this hip hop one on one class, and then I did the curriculum. So I would love to do it at some point, but uh, you know I'm always traveling. But you know, a couple of semesters, yeah, I would love to do it. Um, what advice would you give any young MC trying to come up? Wow, good question. I would say education, education, education is the key to success. And if you ever really want to take a look at my life, my personal life story, this is what I did. I majored in a field uh, that was relative to hip hop. And I was the first one that did that. And I thought about it. And I said, I'm going to college now. I love DJing. I love this rap stuff. I love b-boy now. now what field in college is relative that I can really, really, you know, study and get some, some pointers, the theory, practical science behind it, and everything. And it was the field of communication. Speech broadcasting was my major. I had a film minor. And so I took all these speech classes, and it was amazing see how relative they are. Actually, I, 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 I made the first rap theory, meaning like in philosophy, you know how in philosophy, the, the, the key to philosophy and the whole purpose of philosophy, because back in the days, they just named everything. They gave a name to everything. Oh, that's the sun. Oh, and they started, you know, first thinkers trying to figure things out, right? So the philosophy behind rap, the theory is Raps are speeches, right? You have your intro, your body, and your conclusion, right? So I was like, oh, oh my God, I became a speech major. So I'm studying all these speeches. I'm saying, wow, okay, there's the demonstrative speech. That's a speech that tell, talks about different subjects. Basketball, Christmas, <coughs> right? There is... Motivative speaking, inspirational speaking, like pep rallies, right? Inviting people to come to your club. Oh, it's a party time. That's party raps. It's entertaining, uh, inspiring. Come on, let's go have a good time tonight, right? You have your political speeches, of course, you know, to win over your audience. You need the art of rhetoric with that, you know, which is the art of persuasion, right? All of this plays a part in raps. I'm just like, oh my God, this is mind blowing. Here's a good one for you. An extemporaneous speech is one that is not written, is not prepared, is off the cuff. That is just like a freestyle. freestyle. So all these raps, I put them in categories, in boxes, and categorized them, and it became the format for my albums. 
that I made. I would do each category, each kind of speech, each kind of style of rap. I became the party rap of party time, demonstrative basketball Christmas, of course, you know, uh, you know, uh, extemporaneous speeches, and that is my claim to fame to get the rap theory. But the, the, the answer to your question is education is the key. It will give you an advantage over everyone else who doesn't have an education. So you guys are doing the right thing by staying in school. And it's not just education. You know, education is simply the acquisition of information. But what do you do with that info? How do you apply it to your life, right? If you figure that out, then that's when you, you get uh, the same result as everyone else who is successful. And I say study the history of a subject. Whatever it is you want to do, doctor, lawyer, businessman, rapper, DJ, study the history of that subject. Find somebody who is successful within that history. Find out, analyze them, study them very, very hard. Take the same steps, repeat the steps that they took in order to achieve their success, and you will achieve success as well. Guaranteed. Let's get a round of applause. to do the Kickstarter program, we yes. send that out. Please tell people to support, because what's important about this film is uh, th this is a generation that watched what happened with blues, with jazz, with R&B, rock and roll. They saw how the history was appropriated, mm -hmm. and others were credited for it. So what did they do? They gathered the original people that were there, put them in one room, and interviewed them and said, this is it. What you just saw was history right there. And we have to support this because 50 years from now, yeah. if other people have it their way, hip hop started with, I ain't gonna name mm -hmm. people, I ain't gonna go there. Okay. But you'd be surprised the way history can be rewritten. So we have to support this kind of thing. So once again, I just wanna thank Master Rapper Credit.